Welcome back to the Indie Vets Happy Hour. I am your host, Dr. Andrew Heller, DVM, with my co-host as usual, Dr. Marissa Brunetti, VMD. Andrew, we haven't recorded in a couple weeks, so I gotta I I gotta get back on the I know get back I on know. the course. Absolutely. So we have Casey back, very excited. Casey Robinson, our very own ophthalmology expert. I won't call him a specialist, but he's definitely an expert. General practitioner, if you want to hear his credentials, please listen to the previous two episodes that we um, that we had. One was on KCS, and the other one was... Glaucoma. Glaucoma. Thank you very much. <laughs> so today, Casey, we are going to focus on cats. Cats and more cats. Um, feline ophthalmology. And we have a very long lineup of issues that we want to get to, so let's get right to it. Cool. So just to start, feline ophthalmology is arguably one of my favorite subsets of ophthalmology. I really like it. I think that from a kind of like a systemic manifestation or ocular manifestation of systemic disease, cats are honestly really awesome. A lot of infectious processes, neoplastic processes show up in the eye. And it's just, it's it's an easier exam, in my opinion. It's It's a really, really specific type of globe. And I think there's, it's certainly a a much larger window into what's going on than some of the canine patients. But, um, so it's my favorite. I honestly like to move just due due to the breadth of information we have. I figure we'll kind of move from the outside of the eye in, you know, I'll hit the high points, the things that you're going to see in a day-to-day practice. Obviously for general practitioners and other members of the team, this is important, but I will always stress that eye problems are something that our clients see first. 100%. Yeah, this is going to be good for also pet owners to listen to because you can see it's not just pink eye, quote, quote, <laughs> right? It's There's lots of things uh, in cat's eyes. And if you see them, they should see the vet. Absolutely. All right. Outside in. So we're talking about eyelids first. Eyelids first. So I'd say the most common th- for, uh, I'll include the third eyelid, the most common thing you're going to see in the eyelids kind of normal superior and inferior eyelids. You're going to see eyelid agenesis. This is going to be fairly apparent at birth. Um, Traditionally, it's going to be bilateral, and you're going to see it lateralized in the superior portion of the eyelid. Um, Now, this is something that if you're going to fix it, it's going to be surgical. There are literally, I, I I don't even know the number of surgical procedures recommended for it, and one person once told me, if you have tons of procedures for one problem, that means none of them are that good. Um, but I have <laughs> seen some really, really impressive eyelid surgeries to take care of eyelid agenesis. Now, it's not always something you need to do anything about. The main question you have to answer is how are the eyelids functioning? If the cat can open and close its eyes and completely cover its cornea, you can do nothing. But if you're going to have tons of exposure keratitis from the eyelids not working, that's when you have to look into doing something. Question. Yes. How long do you give the kitten? before you realize, okay, this is an issue, right? I mean, they take them, what, two weeks till they open their eyes. And then after that, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll know, I mean, you, I've seen it at that 14 day mark, once the eyelids actually open, like, you'll know pretty rapidly, like, especially comparing kitten to kitten, like something is wrong. They're not going to develop that much after that 14 day. So you'll know pretty quickly um, that there's an eyelid defect. Okay. And this is a specialty surgery, or do GPs, can they be trained to do this as well? I mean, the procedures are really well documented. So if it's a scenario where they can't refer, I don't see harm. I don't think you're going to make it worse. Worst case scenario, you're going to kind of- Take the eye out. Take the eye out. On, to be perfectly honest, at the end of the day, that's <laughs> the answer with a lot. You can fix a lot of eye <laughs> yes. problems by removing the eye. But um, the only thing is sometimes you might get one shot. So there which might not be enough skin left to do a revision. Right. Um, the next thing is going to be blepharitis. I'll just kind of roll through this. There's going to be your infectious causes. Uh, Demodex uh, is going to be your periocular alopecia. Um, they're really itch- itchy if it's Demodex gatui. Uh, dermatophytosis, um, something I've, n- I've never seen, but eyelid myiasis, which is going to be a cuterebra, which... I think when I see that, I'll be good to retire. I think I will have seen everything <laughs> at that point. Yeah. Immune mediated. I've seen that one time. I think it was a pomphigus vulgaris, um, but the cat was, a, a the whole face was an absolute mess, but it definitely had periocular and eyelid involvement. Feline herpes virus can certainly show up in the eyelid. 
And then just inflammation of the meibomian gland openings. I think this is going to be more common in the dog. Um, so a meibomianitis, a hordeolum. A hordeolum is basically a sty. Um, yeah. And then a chalazion. What is the difference between a hordeolum and a chalazion? I think uh, so a chalazion is going to be granulomatous. And a hordeolum is going to be more superative and purulent. That's my understanding, at least. Great. Yeah. That's, and that I, sounds terrible. I think hordeolums are more open, are more amenable with medical management. Chalazians need, usually need to go. Mm-hmm. I've never seen a chalazian in a cat, though. I don't think I have either. Yeah. Or anything that would resemble that. Yeah. Okay. The next thing would be just overall neoplasia. Now, that's a pretty long list, but as with a lot of things in cats, squamous cell carcinoma is going to be a it's going to be up there. They ulcerate pretty commonly. This is your classic white cat that sits by the window for most of its life and then gets a, a lesion somewhere. Mm-hmm. That's going to be that mm-hmm. squamous cell. They do metastasize. There was recently a case report in Clinician's Brief about a really gnarly um, mast cell tumor in the eyelid of a cat, which was mm. pretty cool. And I've seen that a few times. I mean, but otherwise, you you name it, it can pop up in the eyelid, hemangiosarcoma, peripheral nerve shift tumor. Um, it's a cat, so mm. lymphoma can never, ever, ever be off the list. Yep. Fibrosarcoma. Um, and then moving to the extra, the third eyelid, I'd say the two most common in cats are going to be horners. So elevated third eyelid, ptosis, and ophthalmus, and meiosis. Same type of differentials there, first order, second order, third order. You can see bilateral eyelid protru- third eyelid protrusion, which me and Marissa were just mentioning. Um, it, I didn't see it in my textbook, but I believe it's called Haws syndrome, or it's called Haws syndrome, yep. H-A-W-S. The classic thing there is to ask the owner about any diarrhea. It's thought to be correlated with a torovirus, but I think there's a, basically a hydration deficit involved in the eyelid protrusion. But um, hmm. my understanding of it is there's a lack of a sympathetic innervation overall, causing elevation of the third eyelid and an accelerated gastrointestinal transit time Mm. because you have more of a parasympathetic drive. If you see that, always ask about diarrhea. I believe this is self-limiting. Yeah, that's Taking care of the hydration deficit. Cool. Um, They can get the same type of tumors or neoplasia on the eyelid. And then you don't see prolapsed third eyelid glands as much in cats, but you can see them. Um, I've only seen it in Burmese cats, but the Persian hmm. can get it. Uh, I take that back. There was dom- one domestic long or short hair that I did see it in. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Same surgical procedure to fix it. The ones I've seen, though, have been in specialties, so they've undergone the eyelid tacking as opposed to the Morlid- Morgan pocket technique. Yeah, those are fun. Super cool. I see in your notes that you have crossed out KCS and cats. And I just want to know that if we're working on third eyelids, people are going to be like, wait, he didn't mention KCS. Right. So really quickly, is the treatment almost identical to dogs? Yes or no? So I've never treated it. But my understanding is you start them on Optimune just as in dogs. But it's rare. Very rare. Yes. I mean, I remember one ophthalmologist kind of called it her white whale. Like... Oh, mm-hmm. that elusive KCS cat. I think it's just really hard to diagnose because the quantitative or the schirmer tier test values are so fluctuating in cats that mm. it can be very difficult to say, yeah, this cat's tear production is low. You really have to tie a, tie a story together. Usually it's going to be just a consequence of chronic blepharal conjunctivitis, uh, most frequently due to a chronic herpes viral infection. Got it. Awesome. Well, thank you for that tangent. Absolutely. I love it. So moving in, going to be the conjunctiva. Now, the conjunctiva is going to be the most common thing you're going to have cats coming in for. Acutely red, swollen, the pink eye that you that yeah. will be on your appointment list. Mm-hmm. Most commonly, this is going to be herpetic in nature. So feline herpes virus one. I can't say that I see a ton of systemic signs, but I, the two most common that I'm going to see is going to be the, eye, the conjunctival disease and respiratory disease. So always asking about sneezing. Are they sneezing? Because that can affect your um, treatment plan. As with all kind of herpes in general, it's a cat to cat. It's a direct aerosolization. It's going to attack all of your epithelial surfaces. And then just the the classic signs of conjunctivitis, red, swollen, or chemotic eyes, squinty, so blepharospastic, discharge. Always want to check the cornea for ulceration there, but we'll get there. In In terms of treatment, 
for this because this is such a common issue that, that general practitioners see. Can we just go through some of the common treatments for conjunctivitis in cats? Because I know um, in terms of you know inventory, we keep a lot of meds for dogs and we don't necessarily use the same ones. So can you just go through some of that with us? For sure. So when I, I mean, the first question you have to ask is, is this a, a cat that needs treatment? Because this can be self-limiting. I'd say most commonly, I will send them home on teramycin just to cover my bases on any, any like chlamydophila, mycoplasmal, conjunctivitis, just again, just, just as you would with a dog preventing and covering your bases. And also since it's an oxytetracycline, you will get an anti-inflammatory benefit from it. If they're really squinty, I will send them home with a few days of buprenorphine, or you can also do an ANSI or any young cat. I'd say that would be the most aggressive. Now, if you're really sure or you're, it's not responding, that's when you would move to something like a famciclovir or a sodofovir, and far less commonly, um, idex uridine. That's what I was going to ask. You know, when do you decide to do antiviral, topical antivirals right away? So if, if you would, if it's just conjunctival disease, I probably won't. If I have a really, really nasty conjunctivitis, a corneal ulcer, most notably that doesn't respond to a short course, because again, it should heal in that seven day period. If it doesn't respond, that's when I'll move to an antiviral. Um, I like sidofovir. I have heard that it's a little singy. So I also really like famcyclovir. And famcyclovir, 100% if you have a concurrent respiratory sign. Okay. That topical. Topical would be your, your sidofovir and your teramycin would be your go-tos there. So famcyclovir is a pro-drug for pencyclovir, and there's no eye drop for that, at least yet. Be a good idea. Right. That would be. All right. What else are we seeing in the, in the conjunctiva? So um, commonly in your young kittens, you'll see simblepharon. So that's basically an adhesion of conjunctiva to conjunctiva or conjunctiva to cornea. Basically, they get ulcerations in one of those two tissues. And we know that wounded or ulcerated tissues are sticky and they like to attract to each other and stick together. Um, that's your simblepharon. I've seen an entire litter of kittens with such horrible simblepharon that we had to nucleate every eye out of every kitten in the entire litter. Oh my goodness. That was a long day. And they're teeny tiny eyeballs. But yeah, so it's going to be primarily after a severe primary infection, less likely to occur in older cats. But it's going to be, again, a consequence of that chronic herpes viral conjunctivitis. You can break them down. Just when you break them down, they're probably going to stick back together. Hmm. I have heard of people using things like mitomycin C, like an antifibrotic, to try to prevent it. But to my knowledge, really nothing's great for addressing simblepharon. Sucks. On my notes, I kind of bounce into some herpes viral stuff here, just because I think it was kind of important. But just some things, since I'm talking so much about herpes virus, you know, these recurrent conjunctivitis cats, that's going to be the most common manifestation of those latent carriers of feline herpes. It can be unilateral, it can be bilateral, and always ask about concurrent respiratory signs. Sneezing. They don't always get an infection per se, but it can cause a rhinitis that virus lays latent in the trigeminal ganglion. Overall, herpes is really hard to diagnose. It's hard because you can have asymptomatic cats popping positive and symptomatic cats popping negative. Um, so tie together a story. I'm not even going to go into viral isolation and such. Quick question. Do you ever use lysine as a supplement to treat herpes? I do. I do. Um, I have that coming up later, but I, I do. And a lot of people, there's kind of three groups of studies there's a study that says it works. There's a study that says it doesn't work. And there's a study that says it makes it worse. In my opinion, it, it either helps or doesn't do anything at all. It does nothing. Yeah. yeah. I don't think you're going to hurt the situation if the owner's down for it. And that can be, again, if, if owner's been dealing with chronic recurrent conjunctivitis or herpes viral rhinitis, you're not going to hurt anything by putting them on a daily supplement of lysine. Yeah. Now, is it maybe dose dose dependent with the lysine? Like I was always told that it had to be 500 milligrams twice daily for an Correct. adult cat. Correct. And and on, on usually on these bottles, it usually says the dose is 250. Yeah. And so I always tell mm -hmm. people, don't look at what it says on the bottle. Do twice as much. Yep. Exactly. 500 megs twice a day, ongoing. Yeah. 
Yes, Killed. Andy, yes. well done. Yeah, been doing it right. <laughs> Man, you had the dose and everything. Yeah. So impressive. I don't know where I pulled that out of. <laughs> I thought you had a textbook, like, open right in front of you. No, <laughs> no I, I I dream of doses at night. I try to remember all of them, you know. You, you, you got you to gotta stay sharp, right? Got yeah. To. Um, you can always do a cytology on these if you want to see. You're going to see primarily a neutrophilic, you know, infiltration. You're going to see some epithelial cells. Some bacterial things you can see, um, Chlamydophila, Khaleesi virus, always look for oral ulcers in these guys. They can help you with your Khaleesi diagnosis. Mycoplasma, I've never been able to say yes or no, but Bordetella can technically affect cats and it can technically cause a conjunctivitis. Yeah. I don't know if I've ever confidently had that on my differential list. One interesting one that you might see is going to be a neonatal conjunctivitis or neonatal ophthalmia. That's basically an infection behind the eyelids prior to them opening. Yeah, I've seen that. Yuck. Yep. And it's you're going to see the, the closed eyelid, but it's going to be puffed out. And you're going to see a little bit of drainage from either the medial or the lateral canvas. Basically, open the eyelids. You're not going to have any consequence long term to opening eyelids that haven't opened on their own yet. And you got to treat that infection, look for an ulcer, treat accordingly. The, yeah, those eyelids are going to open around 14 days. So Marissa, I was right about two weeks. That was a good guess. You were right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the rest of the, of the, I've never, I can't, nothing that really should, you know, is going to fly in your radar a lot. There's a liprogranulomatous conjunctivitis, eosinophilic conjunctivitis, parasitic, so thalasia can cause a conjunctivitis. Mm. Um, and then they can get tumors, melanoma, lymphoma, squamous cell. Um, so it's going to be kind of conjunctival disease overall. Piggybacking on that, we'll move to the next layer, the cornea. Sweet. No, I can't wait to talk about herpes keratitis. It's great. <laughs> Not great for the cat, but great. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's fun <laughs> to diagnose, especially if you see a dendritic. So in addition to seeing conjunctival disease, you're going to see corneal disease. Second most common manifestation of feline herpes virus. If you see it early on in the disease process, you can see it as a dendritic ulcer, which is like a branch, almost looks like coming off of a tree. Then it becomes more geographic. That's when the cat's going to become more clinical for it. So they just rarely bring them in when you actually have a dendritic ulcer because the cat's not going to be super duper clinical. Is that a pathognomonic to... That is pathognomonic. If you see a dendritic ulcer in a cat, that's what it is. And yeah, story over. (laughs) And then you would go right to oral antivirals and topical? I would do teramycin, depending on how painful. I would do probably atropine. Always use ointment in the cat. Mm. Don't use the solution. They're going to foam. They're going to look like they're rabid beasts. Mm. And I've even seen that with ointment. So cats are very, very sensitive to atropine. But these ulcers can heal spontaneously or they can become kind of chronic indolent type ulcers, even if you do antiviral therapy. They certainly have a vascular response as with all corneal insults. Kind of going deeper into the cornea, you can get a stromal keratitis, which is going to be basically the virus gets into the stroma and causes an inflammatory response Um, You're going to see kind of a haziness within the stroma and a lot of times really, really deep vessels as opposed to the superficial vessels we'll see commonly. Question for you about those, that neovascularization. I know we didn't really ever talk about ulcers and dogs either, and we probably won't get to that in this series. Sorry, Marissa. (laughs) It's a good one. We should rethink that. We'll we'll have it. We'll rethink that. We'll get there. We can talk about that. My question is, once you see neovascularization, is it ever going to go away? Yes. Or are they there for good? It goes away. It regresses. Sometimes they'll become things called ghost vessels, which you can really only see with a slit lamp. But it's just this basically a hollowed out vessel. There's no like blood coming through. And it's something that it's so, so, so subtle. Hmm. You know, if it's a really bad ulcer, you can certainly see some scarring and some fibrosis, but those vessels will regress. I always wonder that, you know, you treat them and people ask me, you know, are these going to be here forever? And I'm just like... I'm not sure. Yeah, no, they'll go away. Most of them do. Awesome. Yeah. One huge note is cats treated with topical steroids for other non-herpetic diseases like a uveitis. They're at risk of developing these herpes viral ulcers or this herpes viral keratitis. Um, you know, up to ha- basically half of the clinically normal cats 
have been found to have herpes viral DNA within their cornea. Herpes, man. The gift that keeps on giving. When in doubt, call it herpes. <laughs> These cats, they they get the herpes virus before they're vaccinated, right? In their colony or wherever from their mother. And it's just with them forever. Right? It's with them forever. Yeah, they're going to get it early on. The vaccine's okay, but it's incomplete. It's temporary. And I think it will basically shorten the duration and limit the severity of the disease, but it's not just like the Bordetella vaccine. You're still going to see some dogs with Bordetella that are vaccinated. They just don't get as sick and they're not sick for as long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. So then the next thing that we'll see commonly on the cornea is going to be corneal sequestra. These are pretty easy to spot. Just look at one picture and I think you'll have it. It's a big black crusty blob in the middle of the cornea, Mm -hmm. basically stromal necrosis you know, chronic ulceration, most likely from feline herpes. (laughs) Always is. I know. It'll start kind of faint and brown, but then it'll just progressively get darker and nastier. Healing is unlikely. They're going to get a dramatic vascular response. Cats are painful. And one huge thing to always keep in mind, never do a grid keratotomy on a cat. Never. That will happen to you. (laughs) You will see that commonly. Treatment, it's honestly, in my opinion, is going to be keratectomy, where you actually remove that. Depending, they'll sometimes they'll do a conjunctival graft, or some ophthalmologists will do something called a corneal conjunctival lamellar transposition, where they kind of scooch up cornea. They like liberate the cornea and scooch it up to fill in the defect, mm. and it's just going to make for a um, better visual pathway because they don't have that big blob of conjunctiva. So that's a referral. Oh, yeah. 100%. One hundred percent. Yep. What if they don't refer? Will it necrose and 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 like they won't see from that, right? But will it fall off and heal? I don't think so. I know. I've never followed it. Never seen that happen. That you know that might be a scenario where if they can't do anything and the cat's painful, they can't go for a keratectomy. Um, I think you'd be justified in electing a nucleation at that point. Good point. Yeah. Another favorite of mine is eosinophilic keratitis. Some people will call it proliferative keratitis. Basically, eosinophilic response on the surface of the cornea. You get these proliferative white, pink, irregular islands on the corneal surface. If you see that, do a cytology. You can just do it with a sterile cotton swab. Um, You'll see an inflammatory cell infiltrate. um, And the hallmark's going to be seeing eosinophils. You really shouldn't see an eosinophil on the cornea. So I've been told if you do a cytology and you, you see even one eosinophil and you suspected that previously, rock and roll, go right for treatment for eosinophil keratitis. And do you remind us again how to do a cytology of the cornea? Like, are there specific steps? So ideally you do it before Proparacaine, but that's going to be more for like a culture. So I still numb them up with Proparacaine. And then I just basically roll my cotton swab over the affected area, roll it onto a microscope slide and go normally from there. Yeah. I think we don't do enough, you know, corneal cytologies and, and, you know, obviously it's patient specific, but with all of our fear free stuff and possibly some gabapentin on board, that may be, that may be okay. For sure. What would the uh, differential diagnosis be for this? So if you're doing a cytology, it looks like pretty clear cut that it's eosinophil keratitis. What else would you what would you be ruling out? I mean, anything proliferative, I'd be making sure there's not like a corneal neoplasm. They're not going to really look like that, though. You, you, when you see it once, you'll know. So, th- I mean, there's certainly differentials to look through, but it's pretty, um, I don't want to call it pathic mnemonic because it's not. But when you see it, you're like, oh, that is EK for sure. So much so that you abbreviated EK. EK, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you treat it? Yeah. So, I mean, traditionally, people will treat it with steroids, 0.1% dex drops, or predacetate. I will admit I'm more cautious with topical steroids in cats than maybe I even should be. So a lot of times I'll start them off on Optimune just to see if it gets better and address their pain. I know some people also advocate use of like a diclofenac or something like that along with it. But steroids or Optimune, the idea is to control the disease, gradually taper, until you get to a good maintenance dose. You know, some cats will do well at once or twice a week 
topical steroid and that keeps it under control. Hmm. This will get into like a referral. This is nothing I've ever done on my own, but you can also use megastrol acetate systemically to get that. Hmm. There's a huge correlation with herpes with, with eosinophilic keratitis. So seeing that, that I think that's my, in, kind of inherently why I get nervous. Cause I'm like, if this cat is going to have an, another flare up of some herpetic disease, by me treating it with predacetate or dexamethasone, should I try something else first? And that's just how I do it. And I've seen some respond and I've seen some that don't. So I have to move to a steroid and to be perfectly honest, they've done fine. But I always just try that first to see if it works. Would you feel better doing that if you also did oral antivirals at the same time? I have done that. I have done that. And I've always done, I've always done famcyclovir. Yeah. Yep. And there's really no consensus based on the last, last I knew, there was no consensus that basically they say you could, it probably won't hurt anything. Got it. There's other keratopathies that we won't really go into just because it's nothing you really see. We've touched on this, but we'll just kind of go into treatment overall for feline herpes. Yeah. Again, it may be indicated it might not be. Conjunctivitis is frequently self-limiting. When you're treating a herpetic ulcer, one thing that is not done as much as it should be, is numb up the eye, debride the ulcer bed. Yes. Try to decrease that viral burden as much as possible prior to treatment. Mm-hmm. Topical antibiotics, I usually will go to teramycin or rofloxacin, some kind of analgesic, onsior, buprenorphine, always put a cone on them. And then I just said plus minus atropine, and making sure you use the ointment. Um, I find that a lot of them will do better or not, be- I don't want to say better, but they'll do just fine on an oral pain med and your topical, and you can skip atropine. If the owner calls and says she's still squinty in a few days and you know pressures are normal, dispense, you can do some atropine for sure. Okay. I rarely see atropine ointment in any hospital that I'm at. It's usually the drops. Do you Have you guys seen ointment a lot? I've seen the ointment. Not a lot. I'd say I've seen the ointment more so as like an in-hospital. Yeah. Because, you know, if sometimes, sometimes you can easily just do one strip of atropine, know that it'll last for 72, sometimes more hours. That's true. And by that time, you're well on your way to healing. That's true. Oh, so it's not a, it's it's not daily when you're using atropine? I'll usually do it every 24 to 48, but you can see the residual effects of the atropine for a few quite a few days, especially in dark colored irides. I was told that it can basically bind melanophores hmm. and then act like a slow release so it'll be prolonged so the dark eyed dog is going to be mydriatic longer than the husky with blue eyes hmm. i'll be honest i haven't read the paper on that but it's something i've heard a few times all right well the good news i just looked up atropine ointment on good rx and it's only like 15 bucks that's so cheap yeah it used to be like 94 actually at costco it's like at Costco, it's ten bucks. Whoa! And Giant Eagle, six dollars and seventy five cents. So I love Good RX. I do great. too. It's great. Mm-hmm. So oral famciclovir is another option. Doses vary. I know they're recommending ninety milligrams per kilogram every eight to twelve hours. I've seen it work at considerably lower doses. I've seen it work at sixty two and a half milligrams twice a day, one twenty five twice a day, two fifty twice a day. I have to say 250 twice a day is probably the most common one that I do, knowing that I can go up. But sometimes 90 mg per keg is kind of, is, is a, a lot for if, if it's a 12, 13 pound cat. Mm-hmm. Are there side effects? I think there is some mild concern with renal, but it's been very, very well tolerated in my experience. I think it's bitter. They don't like taking it. Mm. And then a good kind of adjunctive slash maintenance therapy for herpes is going to be lysine. Like Andrew mentioned earlier, 500 milligrams every 12 hours basically lessens the severity in adult cats and most beneficial when you combine. I just want to say I didn't read this before <laughs> I said that 500 milligram dose. Lie. You. <laughs> Lie. I really did remember that. It's all you. So moving on the inside, the anterior uvea. So one thing to always just kind of a fun fact your blue-eyed cats, your Siamese and the such, look for things like strabismus or estotropia and nystagmus. Mm-hmm. I remember multiple referrals in veterinary school for nystagmus and blue-eyed cats, and that's just a variation of normal. 
has to do with the amount of crossover that goes on kind of from a post-retinal standpoint. Persistent pupillary membranes or PPMs, those are cool. Basically a string of tissue extending from the iris to the cor- to the endothelial layer of the cornea, or sometimes they can be iris to iris. And sometimes they'll be kind of like a white fibrotic area on the cornea itself. These are best visualized if you look from the side. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of like when you're looking at, looking for like flare, aqueous flare, you can see just this string. How does this differ from, from Senechia? I think Senechia is going to be more of like a disease process. Okay. going to be an artifact of like uveitis as opposed to something more congenital. There's no underlying disease process associated with a PPM. If you have a syneciated area, a lot of times there's something else going on causing to have caused that. Got it. Okay. So then, of course, uveitis. I think uveitis needs a fair shake. So I was thinking we can maybe talk about uveitis at another. Of course. So sit tight. Feline uveitis is cool and... Not as cool as pigmentary keratitis, though, right? Not as cool. Oh, no, as sorry. Eosinophilic. eosinophilic keratitis. Yeah. Do you have a favorite opto book that shows like pictures of everything yeah. that you're talking about? Because I know a lot of this is you have to kind of see it to know what it is rather than just to describe it. I really like Slater's. I think that's a good all around. If you're going to have one opto book, that's really good. There's like the Optho Bible, which is Gelat, which is like two volumes. Like you don't need anything like that. Yeah. Then there are some other atlases, but I like Slater's because they're going to talk to you. Like the atlases aren't going to always go into treatment or diagnostics, whereas Slater's is and always has really good pictures. Mm. Maybe we can uh, we can link to that in the show notes. Yeah, for sure. It's 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 a good one. That's the one I have. Other uveal disease, neoplasia, we're all familiar with the diffuse irritable melanoma. That's that progressive pigmentation of the iris. Changes in pupil shape and mobility are some prognostic indicators. Hmm. Looking at things like secondary glaucoma from tumor infiltration into the irrocorneal angle. People always ask, what do I do? I think if you have a progressive pigmentation on the surface of the cornea, plus minus changes to mobility or pupil shape, so dyschoria, I think you are justified to recommend a nucleation. If it comes back normal, that's good news. And there was no neoplastic process. If it comes back as a diffuse irritable melanoma, you made the right call. And another thing from a, they'll always look at the, the venous plexus to see if they have seen any neoplastic cells there, because that's going to have a bearing on any metastasis. Hmm. It's always, 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 always take chest rads in these guys too. Mm. That's a that's a really hard one because I know we see a lot of iris pigmentation that's benign, right? Um, like melanosis, mm-hmm. I guess. And so melanosis, nevus. Can you restate? I think you just did. You know how you would make that decision fairly quickly. I guess it's kind of hard rather than right. like sitting on it for a whole nother year and then they come back. You know what I mean? Right. A lot of times, what I'll do is I'll document, take a photo, and say come back in three to four months and see what's happened. If it's progressed in that amount of time, I'd be having that conversation about a nucleation. But I like it's it's kind of a scenario where again, it's you're, you're, no one's going to shake a finger at you for making that call if you see a progression of nasty right. pigment on the iris face. Okay, cool. Most notably, if you see dyschoria, so abnormal pupil shape or um, an abnormal PLR, then you're really, I think those were shown to be the most prognostic Got it. for iris melanoma. So I may have misheard this, but I swear that you said corneal pigmentation instead of iris pigmentation before. So I, I might have. It, it is pigmentation on the iris face. Got it. Okay. Yeah. There's the ocular sarcoma. That's the second most common primary ocular tumor. Highly malignant, associated with ocular trauma. Hmm. So, you know, penetrating injuries, things like that. I've seen this a few times and it, it's, it's certainly nasty. I know Cats are certainly predisposed to some of those kind of like iatrogenic type sarcomas, like the injection site sarcoma from back or the vaccine induced yep. sarcoma I meant. So s- similar there, um, surgical removal of the affected globes is recommended, but a lot of these cats do unfortunately pass away rather quickly. Wow. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever seen one. I've seen one. No, two. Okay. Two. One of them was another cat claw injury. Oh. Okay. Had been... 
Um, I don't remember what happened with the other one. Oh yeah. So then there's ciliary body neoplasm. So lymphosarcoma, most common metastatic intraocular tumor. Um, these can be diagnosed with an aqueous humor cytology. Hmm. So actually getting a sample of aqueous and sending that in to see if they see any neoplastic cells. A lot of time, basically, this is just one of those manifestations of multisystemic disease. Got it. Lens disease is pr it's pretty straightforward in cats. Um, so they do get cataracts. They're considerably more rare than in dogs. There's primary, again, rare. There's secondary. Most common reason for a secondary cataract is going to be anterior uveitis. But things like trauma, glaucoma, luxation... A long time ago, there was an arginine deficiency in the kitten formula. Hmm. So they would get classic cataracts. I don't really think that's an entity anymore. Certain infectious processes, I always pronounce this completely incorrectly, but encephalitozoon cuniculi. Pretty good. <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, traditionally, a rabbit lenticular disease, but I know it is shown to pop up in cats as well. And one thing to always know is... Diabetic cataracts are very rare in cats. So after they're four years old, they don't have the aldose reductase needed to actually form the sorbitol, which has that strong osmotic pull. Mm. Given that the average diagnosis is around seven years, diabetic cataracts, unless diagnosed around basically four years or under, are very, very un uncommon. Interesting. I was thinking that with my diabetic cat who's now showing signs of neuropathy. I was like looking at his eyes and I was like, I don't think you get <laughs> cataracts, but yep. I have to ask Casey. <laughs> we, we don't need another problem for your cat. No, 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 we don't. Mm -mm. Surgery, surgery is identical. Fake oak, emulsification and aspiration. Um, and cats traditionally do better than dogs. Nice. Then the next thing's going to be luxation, uh, uveitis or glaucoma is going to be the two most common. Now, this doesn't ha really ha cause a secondary glaucoma like it does in cat and sorry, in dogs because their anterior chamber is so considerably bigger mm. that there's not there's more room for the lens to sit and it's not going to affect that outflow. Specific treatment is going to be an intracapsular lens extraction. Prognosis depends on a few things, but overall a primary lens luxation is going to have a really good prognosis. Good. I've seen these before. Yeah. They're pretty common. Common, and you kind of just see that classic aphacent crescent. You can see kind of like the edge of the lens over the pupil, and you're like, some. they just don't look right. They don't look right, yeah. I'm wondering why cats develop to have a larger anterior chamber than dogs. It's a good question. I don't know. I know. I'm going to look this up. I'll get back to you, everyone. It makes it hard to... Um, because there's when you have a lens luxation, you can do it's called a transcorneal reduction, hmm. where you actually sedate the animal, numb the eye, and push the lens back behind the iris. Cool. And then you plug it with latanoprost or some kind of meiotic just to trap it back there. I've never heard of it being successfully done in a cat just due to the size of their anterior chamber. Uh -huh. But it's cool. I've done it a few times. I've taught a few people to do it, and they're, all, they're always really stoked because animals will do really well. Just get that lens back behind the iris, keep them on long-term meiotics, and they, they do well. Can they see? As long as, yeah, as long as there's no, there's been no like acute glaucoma spike causing retinal or optic nerve damage, they can see. Hmm. I mean, they're looking through a tiny, tiny pupil, right. but there is functional vision. Okay, cool. Yeah. Then I'm going to skip posterior segment disease because there's really not much notable there. Then the retina. And I think retinal disease is most easily learned by looking at concurrent pictures. So I'm just going to run through some of the common things we see. And then you can kind of Google them and look at some of the pictures. But um, retinal dysplasias, a long time ago, there was the taurine deficiency in cats or in cat food causing nutritional retinopathies. And that's inherently, you see this really bright hyper-reflective area right around the center of the retina called area centralis, super bright. I've only seen it one time and always making sure you sculpt these patients because if it is truly a nutritional retinopathy and there was a taurine deficiency, um, making sure there's no concurrent DCM mm. or any cardiac disease because they're both noted. Interesting. Retinal degeneration is rare in cats, but it can happen. One notable one would be a drug-related retinopathy, so Batril or enrofloxacin. A lot of things go into kind of how risk factors for use. 
dose, duration of administration, route of administration. If possible, using protofloxacin is superior because that's been shown to be less retina toxic. Hmm. It's hard to find. I believe it's yeah. fairly expensive. I believe they're recommending two and a half for Batril, two and a half mg per kg twice a day in the healthy cat. Yep. I was going to say five mg per kg total. total, never above is what, yep. yeah, what I learned too. Sometimes your hands are tied and you're pyelonephritis cats or things like that. And you've got to go for it. So yeah. just knowing how to use it. And I would bump that dose down if it's a renal cat or something like that. Yep. So then there's chorioretinitis or chorioretinopathies. Basically, inflammatory processes that have come from the coronoid and extend into the retina. A lot of infectious processes do this. FIV, FELV, FIP, fungal disease, protozoal disease like toxo. Mm. Those can all cause a chorioretinopathy. So if you see anything similar, have some of those things on your radar. And of course, considering signalment and all that, but that would be something to consider. And they can be old lesions. So if you see tons of like bright areas, it could be an old coronary retinopathy that they've gotten over. So learning how to differentiate active versus inactive retinal lesions can help you there. And if it's active, I mean, I assume, I I did practice in Texas, so I did see some fungal stuff. And yeah. like, you would assume that they're most, they're all, they're also sick, right? Or could it just be confined to the eye? So, I mean, I think it all depends. I think it all depends. It could be kind of, it's showing up in the eye before it's showing up systemically. Mm -hmm. I have found them incidentally. And I'll be honest, I can say, I can say, we can test for this multitude of things. We can monitor. There's a few options there, but you know, in that sick eight, I, I hate the term ADR, <laughs> but in that sick ADR cat, you're always going to be justified to take a peek at the fundus. Yeah and see if you see any retinal lesions that would direct you. Cryptococcus has a really classic mm. look in the retina. It's, I hope you guys never see that out there. I know. <laughs> I know it's bad. You're going to need that Slater book to, to know what the <laughs> retina looks like. Seriously. Right yeah, I know it's in there. I think it's even on the cover. Oh, great. I'm looking at it right now. Um, I think the most clinically relevant for the general practitioner is going to be hypertensive retinopathy. Mm -hmm. So relatively common disease of older cats, most consistently associated with chronic renal insufficiency and hyperthyroidism. That's that acute blindness. I mean, if I have a hyperthyroid cat that they call and say she's officially blind, probably the first part of my exam is going to be a fundic exam. Um, and you just see that classic waving retina in the back of the eye. I don't know if I would pick this up still. I have a hard time. And it's, I mean, sometimes it'll be so obvious that it's like blanketed against the back of the lens and you can just see, you're like, those vessels look weird. Like I shouldn't see what I'm seeing. Got it. Like, that's what I see. Like when I look at the retina, but if, if you just look at pictures and I'm like, a lot of people will call it a curtain. Mm -hmm. It'll look like a curtain is folded over mm. and you just see like sheets coming at you and they can have partial, but definitely looking for concurrent retinal hemorrhage yep. is going to be another thing as well. Okay. So a lot of times this is going to be the first indication of systemic hypertension. So those acutely blind animals. Prognosis for return of vision is pretty, pretty poor. Yeah. I forget the time frame that you have the ability to do a retinal reattachment surgery in cats. It differs from dog to cat. But I mean, for people in Michigan, we have to travel to, I think, Chicago for retinal reattachment surgery in animals. Wow. So it's a hard sell. Yeah. You know, and there, there's there's other th other things to consider with the retinal disease. I've never seen a diabetic retinopathy. I have seen an anemic retinopathy. Um, I've seen incidental retinal folds, um, retinal detachment due to, honestly, probably a list of the list that we've noted for everything else today, <laughs> except for maybe this is the one thing feline herpes isn't going to do. Are you sure? <laughs> I'm pretty sure, <laughs> but I'll, just a, a lot of your classic infectious diseases, um, ethylene glycol, things like that can cause a kind of like a non-hypertensive hmm. retinal detachment. Wow. Yeah. And then optic nerve, I'll just know two things. There's optic neuritis. These are good. Yep. So viral, parasitic, fungal, FIP is known to attack the central nervous system on the optic nerve. Um, toxoplasmosis, crypto. And then one of my soapboxes is going to be CNS blindness secondary to 
the use of mouth gags yeah. for dentals. Mm. Um, basically occludes the maxillary artery, which feeds the retina. The other species have multiple different sources of a blood supply to the retina as opposed to the cat. Hmm. But cats are very predisposed to that. So never use a mouth gag in a cat. No. Should you ever use neopolybac in a cat's eye or neopolydex for that matter? I do not. I do not use neopolybac or neopolydex in cats. With that being said, I know there's the risk for anaphylaxis. I've seen tons of cats come in and they are just fine. If you're looking for an antibiotic, you have better options. If you're looking for a steroid, just go with 0.1% dexamethasone. Just completely eliminate that possibility. Yeah, amazing. I, I, I can't believe I didn't even see the word neopoly anything in all of your notes. So I was like, we should probably touch on this just in case. For sure. I, f- I find neopoly dex to be an interesting drug just simply because I, it's hard for me to find a logical indication for it. Because if there's infection, you shouldn't be using a steroid. What about neopoly? Oh, you just mean the dex part. The dex. Neopoly back's great for, for dogs. It's probably my, my go-to first-line antibiotic for dog ulcers. Got it. Or neopoly grams fine, too. Neopoly gram. Okay. But yeah. 0.1% dexamethasone is only about $23 on GoodRx, everyone. So. Oh, perfect. Yeah. That's really good. It's also good for dogs. Yeah, prednisolone was so expensive. How much is that now? $22. No kidding. At CVS on GoodRx. Hmm. It was like over a hundred for a while. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I would say those those are the high points for kitty cats. I'll probably mention them again on uveitis. I think any anything corneal we do will be pretty um, limited to dogs, just because we definitely covered a lot of the corneal disease in cats. What do you think about just doing like a short episode just on ulcers and dogs? Perfect. All right, awesome. So let's do that, and then we'll do a sh- short episode on uveitis and cats, and then do the things to keep in the pharmacy. Yep. Slash diagnostics. Yep. Awesome. Sounds good. All right. Well, this has been illuminating today, everyone. <laughs> nice. <laughs> we do have to come up with a good name for this cat one. All right. I'll let you guys think about it. <laughs> All right. Well, I do want to thank you, Casey, for being back on the show. And this is not the end. We will be having you back for some other ophthalmology pearls. So stay tuned, everybody. Awesome. Thank you for having me. We hope you enjoyed this episode on the Indie Vets Happy Hour. Thank you for listening. Tell your friends. And if you like us, leave us a five-star review and make sure to subscribe so you can be alerted whenever we have a new episode. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, you can email us at clinical at IndieVets.com. Also, to learn more about us and how we're making vet med better, head to IndieVets.com. That's I-N-D-E. V-E-T-S dot com. While you're there, be sure to head to our blog for the latest stories and tips from our doctors. And lastly, if you're interested in joining our amazing IndieVets team, please email Dr. Andrew Heller at Andrew at IndieVets.com. See you next time. Cheers. Cheers. I'm a veterinarian, sure, but I'm way more than that. I am also a tango dancer a struggling but determined pie maker, and a mom. With IndieVets, I get to choose when and where I work. I create my own schedule and choose shifts at nearby animal hospitals that are right for me. Having that flexibility is exactly what I need to have plenty of time for all those other things that I am. Because I'm more than just a vet. Visit IndieVets.com to learn more and apply.